Well, yes. I, uh, you know what? I try to uh, plan a marathon of a speech, but uh, I want to be sympathetic and be kind to you guys. <laughs> I'm not going to go to the long history of South Africa, which I think everybody at least knows about it. I'll talk just a little bit of the, uh, make general comments in an unstructured way. I'm just going to, the reason for that is because I believe that uh, South Africa's history of racial discrimination, economic exploitation, and social degradation and political domination is well documented world over. I do not therefore intend as I have already said, to go on. I want just you to know that the struggle in South Africa have had its highs and lows. Our people have fought for more than 300 years against colonization and disposition. And um, things have not been good most of that period. There were terrible setbacks on numerous occasions. Um, the wars of uh, what they call, uh, the, we call them wars of dispossession, and they call them the frontier wars in that country, were fought many times. And uh, sometimes the colonialist war, Sometimes our people lost badly. But in those days, they were fighting against loosely. That means the various tribes of South Africa, the Tosas, the Zulus, and so on, they were fighting with the colonialists as they beat them. And the colonialists also, before that, before 1910, they were fighting as Afrikaners, and as the Brits. <laughs> but in, uh, in, uh, when the Afrikaners discovered diamond and gold, the British went after them and created a war, which was called the Anglo Boer War, which, uh, which ended in uh, 1899. And then out of that, they signed a treaty between Britain and the Afrikaners and then they formed the Union of South Africa. But uh, black people were not included in that Union of South Africa. And that frustrated them and led to them coming together for the first time, all the tribes of South Africa, to form an organization called the African National Congress in 1912. That organization consisted of, its followers became really the educated, the chiefs, the priests, and uh, sort of the wealthy landed people. It wasn't a mass-based organization in those days. Uh, this group tried to write letters, send deputations to London in anywhere where they could to try and draw the attention of the British rulers about the plight of our people in their own land, and they were ignored. On and around in the 1940s, 1949, um, the people decided to embark on what was called the Defiance Campaign. It was led by young leaders of the time. Amongst them, it was Nelson Mandela and the Walter Sassoon and other people that you know from South Africa, the big names. And um, of course, that had its own problems in that uh, it just, uh, they had to, to decide at that time that they got to embark on more uh, uh, action oriented kind of activities, such as marching, which is a thing they didn't do before, demonstrations, etc., etc. But I'm going to move very fast and step into a thing that changed the face of the South African political struggle on and around 1960, 
when the South African government shot and killed more than 60 black South Africans because they were protesting against um, the past laws. And that event led to uh, uh, general condemnation from all over the world of the South African government. And that did angered a lot of people in South Africa, including Nelson Mandela and others, who decided that they will form a military wing to counter what they believe, the military onslaught by the government. The government moved swiftly to respond to that by rounding them up quickly, bend all the political organization, send the leaders to jail, others fled across the borders of our country and left for exile. And the rest that were caught were sent to prison, Nelson Mandela included, and led to the trial, which you know as the Rivonia trial. Between 19, after they were sentenced, the Mandelas, there was a general lull, quietness in the South African resistance movement in real terms because the shock of the state, in the, the way they shocked the nation in its reaction and response, it frightened people back. They didn't want even to hear the word Mandela, let alone the organizations. It was just nothing. From 1963, when Mandela was sentenced, or 64, black people on their own, with no white person present or anything like that, they were so scared and terrified that they wouldn't even mention the word Nelson Mandela or Sisulu or any one of those people. That's the, the extent of the shock that they they receive our people from this reaction of the state. Then, on, in 1968, around about that time, a guy called Steve Bandubigo and others started to raise the confidence of the black people. They started to say, hey, come on, guys, wake up! The people were fast asleep, they were so scared. But unfortunately, Steve Bigo and his friends also were restricted to uh, universities and uh, platforms of very intelligent people and clever people. But they came with a thing that says black consciousness movement. The purpose of this was to try in their wisdom to get the black people at least to be mentally liberated from the psychology of believing now, because apartheid were managed now to believe that black people were really, there was no separation between white people and God. It was equal, it was the same thing. And still, Biko wanted to wash that thing out of the heads of the people. And said, hey, come on guys, this is not right. And at that time, black people were busy, you know, using creams to try to be white. Because apartheid told them that you, you are half people, you are ugly, you are this and that and that. Still, Bigo said it's nonsense. But anyway, I jumped to, uh, uh, to the time uh, there was a, the student uprising of 1976, which you all know about. It was against uh, the, the education system. And I'm sure you are aware, every one of you, that Steve Bigo was killed in 1977. <clears throat> then, of course, this is a time I personally came into the picture on and around 1975, 76, 77. But I'm a small guy, very curious, hating discrimination, uh, have no political background, have no family members who have been in any struggle let alone the struggle. I had no people who were educated in my family. Nobody was educated, so I was just, by sheer determination, wanting to be educated. And then what happened to me? When I came to the city, then that very past law that led to the killing of our people in 
stop me. Boof! You can't go forward. Out. I was taken out of a classroom, which I qualified to get in in terms of my uh, results, which were good. But when they wanted what they call is a is a family card, then I was in trouble. And then I I was taken out of the school. Wow! I said, "Hey, yeah? really?" I knew apartheid was bad. I knew racism was evil. And I thought this was directed to my family. Because where I came from, I came from the farms of South Africa. Eh? In South Africa, when you say you come from the farms, you don't mean you come from the place that got nice horses and all those places. <laughs> it means, <laughs> what do you call uh, Reverend Lawson in the, the deep south? <laughs> in the cotton farm uh, plantations. It was a kind of a thing, even worse. But anyway, that's how I started to get involved anyway with anybody who was talking. My ears were just wanting to hear anything that opposes this government, especially opposing the, the past law. I will walk, I don't care where the meeting is. I want to be there. And believe me, in those days, there were very, very few people who were worried about this. <laughs> they didn't care. They said, okay, if I go stop, bad luck on me, I go and keep quiet. I said, I won't keep quiet. I'm not going back on the farms. But to cut the long story short, really, that is basically the background about me. Then I want to step to the thing that is most important for everybody who's here to understand the boycott, and so on and so on. That boycott really, I would have loved to tell you more. <laughs> like uh, Jack warned me that this is not a school of journalism where I went on a marathon of uh, talking and there I told people really how I was born, where I was born, and the what circumstances and all that. So <laughs> I would try to, to move fast now and get into uh, what I think is of interest to everybody, which it will be better answered actually by, uh, uh, by the question and answer uh, method. The, the, well, so you can see over a period of time, this farm boy who is legit, he, uh, who's not, who's, uh, not uh, legitimate, I'm not supposed to be in the city. Arrives in a big city where people there are looking at me as a strange because I was speaking first of all my own language. I speak it with a, a different accent from the people, smart people of the city. And you could imagine I arrived here with shoes that used to be red but I painted because I wanted them to be black so that I can have them to school. I got them from one of the farm, the white farmer's children. So they passed them to me. So I look strange, but I'm a talkative person. I like to talk. And the people, sometimes they are not listening to what I'm saying, but they listen to the strangeness of my voice and the way I look, etc., etc. You see, this goes dates back from 1975 when I first opened my mouth. I said, I, I would prefer to go to jail than to go back to the farms. That was my first thing, which was to be considered later on as a political statement, which I never knew it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> then, you see, why I point that out is for what reason? For the simple reason, I want to show you something. In order to succeed in this business, I heard your questions. What is needed is what? Is consistency. Consistency. People must see you being yourself, being humiliated, being made fun of. They are watching you. They are not paying attention to you, or they pretend they are not paying attention to you. But one day, 
all of those people, even those, those who prosecuted you, are going to be, are going to want to be so close to you and even want to work for you. Like the gentleman you see there, the military man, is interviewed in my offices. <laughs> no, not only because I give him a venue, it's not because I gave him a venue, it's because he's employed by Kuseli Kusta Jack <laughs> on a salary, full salary. No, seriously, this is not a joke. <laughs> Uh, for those of you, maybe, if you want, here in the United States, they have done a lot of documentaries about me, okay? Or any of these English-speaking countries, they did that in, in Norway and so on and so on. But uh, Duplessis worked for me for, for, for eight years. And uh, at the time, Steve didn't barrel to get him. He was in my office there. I employed him because he was a man that was supposed, the reason, you see, he was a, there are guys that were killed, ne? the credit of four. As an intelligence man, he was given a signal what, that said they, those guys must be take, permanently removed from society. You can look at this, what they call credit four in South Africa, you'll hear about the whole story about him, okay? So, but anyway, and then he got fired by the military because he told us what actually happened, which we knew. And then he went to speak to the Truth Commission and he, he was jobless and he was, and then I picked him up, I gave him a job. And a similar story, I'll tell you why I tell you this. The other guy called Dion Nivu, which I am very lucky that I'm alive that he never killed me. In 19, his son got selected into uh, uh, the rugby team, the Craven Week. The Craven Week now is a top uh, uh, rugby league for a schoolboy. Now, the guys, first of all, they just uh, were selecting the guys on the position without knowing their names. At night, when they discovered, wow, this is a beautiful, the guy that nearly, that have killed, nearly killed my uncle. One of the people that were buried there is my uncle, who was killed in my place because I was not at my house and they just fired him, bam, and killed him. But this guy, when his son got taken out, when those guys, the black guys saw, wow, Nico, oh, he's a dog, everybody hates him, take him out. But Nico phoned me in the middle of the night and said, Kuster, listen, they have taken my son out of the team and I know I said, what? I said, okay, who did that? No, I don't know. I said, don't worry, I'll deal with it. That boy was brought back into the team after I phoned them. I said, who did this? The officials, administrators of rugby have nothing to do with them. They said, no, I don't know, it's not me, it's not me. Who took the boy out? No, no, it's not me. Because it's evil that people wanted to do. You cannot have an evil mind at any stage of your life to even think about it, let alone to do it against other people. Because if you are driven by justice, it must show in you that you are fighting for justice. And justice is not something that, you know, you... <laughs> Hello, Al. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm raising that point to show that when you embark on this struggle, you must say, yes, I am going to be isolated. Yes, I'm going to be humiliated. Yes, I'm going to be, uh, there are things that I'm going to lose. There are things that I'm not going to, I'm going to lose friends, I'm going to do that because I'm standing, and at that point, when you're still a small activist, you look so funny to everybody. Even your relatives don't understand you. When a relative member, members of your family comes and asks, where is Dahlia? Who? Hey, 
I don't know. I hear he's just gone to Washington. I mean, to uh, Boston. What? No. James, I mean, uh, whoever, he's just left. He's gone. The family says, so to. Mm, mm. I don't want to say anything. You see, that's how it is. But very soon, all of them, you're going to be such a darling to everybody. That's what happened. Now, in South Africa, a lot of people believe that it was always like that. It was never like that all the time. It became like that because of continuous determination by a few. And people watch that few as they go on with their business, as if they are doing nothing, as if they are not watching. But before you look, because they hear your message, your message is touching them. At some point they feel, oh no, it's not fair that Mary King must carry the cross for me. At some point, somebody is going to say, no, I want to carry my own cross. And that is the time you see something like that. And that is how it happened. It doesn't just happen through osmosis. You believe that out? No, it will just happen in this soul. It doesn't. You're going to work hard. You're going to work hard, hard hard every time and don't set yourself easy goals or quick goals that you want to see the results just have the commitment and faith in believing that what you are your cause you believe in like uh, the, 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 from uh, Russia with the environment yes yeah you see I can see, you just remind myself, the way I used to be like at that time I was young, you know, I was mad. I believe if I'm in a platform like this, who? I wanted to let out everything and pick up everything I could get from everybody there. And that's what, I mean, I'm inspired by people like that because I know, I see a Kuster Jack, honestly, I'm not joking about it, I see a Kuster Jack once you you believe in what you if you believe in it be ready then to be pulled with you. that way they are doing the people are watching you don't think they are sleeping it's just that their conscience comes slow the moment their conscience rises they will be on your side and all of them will be wanting to be your friend and you will have everybody jumping all over the place wanted to participate. So uh, set yourself realistic goal and say you will make your point regardless whether they put this mine of nickel there or not. But everybody will know that you are there. When they, if you lose this battle, there's another battle coming. You don't have to make that battle an epic battle the, so that if you lose that is the end of you. There's no such thing. Here, you're going to lose battles. Here, you're going you're gonna to be pushed back. But you must keep on pedaling. You must pedal on. Because once you stop pedaling, you're not you know what happens if you ride a bicycle, you just fall on your back. So that is one point that I would like to, <laughs> to, to raise about uh, about uh, making sure that you don't get easily discouraged. The implementation of uh, strategies and tactics, it always demand, depends on the conditions on the ground where you are. And on the question I heard somebody talking about, okay, how do I use somebody from another place? It is very important. You guys, today you've got uh, some uh, celebrities that love publicity. First, before you bring them, you must have total control of the situation. And then you bring them yourselves in. Don't, don't bring them when you're weak. They come here, they rattle the cages and everything falls. And then in that way, you will not be able to control 
and they will destroy your cause. And also the people you bring, if you can, must be people, upright people, people with good morals as best as you can because society loves to follow people like that. And uh, your, you have to make sure that actually another thing that is so critical, take time to, to tell your story to everybody. Communicate, as you communicate, the people are listening to you. Even if it's, it's, it's a right of a person when you speak, if he doesn't want to hear you, you can do nothing about it. But your job is just to continue to repeat your story. Repeat your story until they understand you. And then you'll be the strongest person with the strongest message in town very soon. So it is important that you make sure that you communicate. And as far as publicity is concerned, you, you've got to, to be a person that is ready to tell your story. <laughs> you know why I was lucky and different from my comrades in South Africa? I said, look, I'm so confident of my story. I love my story. I want it to be heard by everybody. But Kusta, this is going to lead to you being arrested. The person who arrests me, the good news is that you would have heard my story. <laughs> I want everybody to hear my story. Eh? So, that is how you're going to get your message going. You can't have your message, you say. Oh, no. Mm, I won't talk to Jenny. Man. Jenny is not going to spread this. Speak to Jenny. If he allows you, gives you the air, speak. speak. And the press watches you. Every time, at the beginning, they don't. You, you, you know, in South Africa, it's strange. First, the local press used not to care about reporting about us. And they sent uh, some uh, junior black uh, journalists to go, and those stories will be thrown away not even be written. But when we started to be Mr. Jack, the leader of this in New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, in the Guardian of London, then the picture started to change. And then they started to run themselves with the cameras and came to our story and they told it themselves. So you got that kind of stuff, that's what happened. But at the same time, when you speak to a press also, don't come up with big stories. Because if you start by saying that, no, you want to free Mandela to the local newspaper, say, oh, shit, oh, shit. <laughs> forget, oh, forget it. And then they go to the, um, they don't write your story. Because you're crazy, you want to free Mandela. That is why you start first with the local issues. Through the local issues, you're going to pull everybody out. Like the, the site of the, of the mining there. It's a good example because the people there, they're going to understand what they're saying. For now, they are worried about other things. You say, you're going to bring this? They say, no, thank you. Uh, we've got doctors and the government is clever and so on for now. That's why. But soon, that is the people you must hammer the message to them all the time. Then, through, once you have your local people, that is the basis upon launching yourself to the rich, once you have the regional uh, support, you come up at the national level, everybody hears you. And then you move from that, you go into, then you start to talk about the national issues. Then by that time, you will have heard the people from them. Because remember, this thing is only about numbers. Nobody's going to listen to you no matter how clever you are. If you don't have people behind you, forget it. People are, not, are going to ignore you. So that's how it will work at the level of uh, if you start to mobilize along the steps that I'm talking about. And also, make sure that those little gains, you know, I will say, I did ask uh, a Vigna, <laughs> don't worry how I call you. 
uh, did, did you, did that photo of yours come into the paper? She says, yes. I say, that's a victory. Don't look for a massive victory. That's a victory. Next time when you're there, you're going to again tell the press that you're going there. They're going to come and report. It's another victory. Those are little victories for your followers, your own followers, because people, when they follow their leader, the leader must produce goods. And that is one of them. You must show them step by step that you're getting things. And then in so doing, you will launch yourself into, uh, oh, OK. I'm going to stop now. Although I wanted to talk about the tactics and all that. But anyway, I think I should uh, keep quiet now and uh, allow people to ask questions. Otherwise, I will go on and on. Uh, just give me a, a minute. I want to check whether there's something that I wanted to say. Yeah, just the last point I want to tell you about South Africa. Eh? Yes, uh, I told you that Mandela embarked on the armed struggle, and maybe you may say, okay, Kusta, the struggle then was won in the battlefield through the AK-47 and uh, surface, surface to air missiles. I will tell you that's not a fact, that's, that's nonsense. It's a myth. In 1990, at the time, we defeat, uh, we, apartheid government came to the negotiating table. Their military strength, they could occupy Africa from Port Elizabeth up to Cairo. They could march and they would sweep every little army that could come in front of them. That is a fact. People can say whatever they like, we know it is a fact. The military, the full power of that country, they had everything you can think of, of modern equipment. But their problem was that they couldn't deal with us inside the country. And we have created the isolation for them. Uh, we call for cultural boycott, economic sanctions, arms embargo, academic boycott, and everything, and isolated the country to the point that, as you heard that, General Motors, I sat with the chairman of General Motors there, explained to him that you must pack up, get up, and go, because we are busy now. This is the only way the message, we would love you to come back again. And they pack up, and they move. And to Ford, the same, IBM, the same, they are back into our country. For your information, Port Elizabeth, we got General Motors, we manufacture cars for General Motors, for Ford, for Mercedes-Benz, and VW South Africa. And most of the catalytic converting factories that are supplying the whole world are all mostly based in that area. So we we a strong economy in that area, and that is why we had to hit them where it hurts most. And they were a voice, and they could manage to stop the declare and tell him that things were bad, and therefore it couldn't be business as usual. On that score, I'm going to keep quiet and wait for anybody who has a question. Thank you. I haven't done bad this time here. It looks like I took 30 minutes here. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, two, two questions. One, I imagine you've seen this footage quite a few times. How, how does it make you feel seeing this footage from, from years ago um, now? And, and the second is, 
I'm curious about the early days of, of the boycott when before there was evidence of success and there was crackdown, there was there was violence. How did you speak to, how did you engage the, the, the participants in a way that they would want to continue with the boycott when they were facing direct violence, people were getting arrested and knocked over the head and shot. But what, how did you keep them involved? Yeah. Okay, how do I feel about it? Honestly, funny enough, I try to work myself out today, honestly, to be able to cope with it. I had no uh, emotions today, and uh, normally I do, especially when I watch it at my house. Uh, I never, at my house actually we can't. Even if uh, they play it on the national television, like I told you, I've got a lot of, uh, I'm the only one who got uh, a lot of documentaries in South Africa because I was a free person, like I told you. So a lot has been read. So they keep on, when they play them, I never watch them. And I uh, always turn them off. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that some of the people there have died. Some of the people there are today paupers, etc. I mean, they are very poor, and so on and so on. And um, also, it does uh, bring with what I see is happening now in South Africa, it upsets me. And so generally, on my own, I, 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 wouldn't, I don't like watching that. Uh, talking about the how did you keep the people, first of all, remember, these people, we explained thoroughly. We communicated very well with them as to what step we were going to take. So it wasn't my problem once you reach that stage now for being worried what is happening. Of course, we have told the people who are in for this, we were not saying that there's going to be victory one way or the other, but we were just determined to do what we have to do. If we are beaten out of the way, that's it. We have been beaten before. That's what, that was the point. So we were continuing on that basis. And luckily, like I say, we had the people behind us. Genuinely, I'm not making a joke when I say this, the people were honestly behind us. Actually, when we as leaders said to people they must stop the boycott, it was a big risk on the part of us as leaders to convince our people that we must stop for those reasons that I explained there. So, Peter? Regardless of what you think of yourself, I can't hear you. I said, regardless of what we think of yourself, what you were in the movie was incredibly inspiring to work and has been used in ways you'll never know in terms of helping other people think about the problems they have and their own civil resistance. One point in particular that has been, I think, especially helpful was the decision you all made to create a set of demands, in effect, like a vision about what you want this all to mean and the kind of change you want. I'd like to know what led you to make those demands. How did you get general buy-in? Who did you want to have participate in the formulation of those demands? Was there any point in time where there was friction between those who were thinking about it in terms of what were important and not important? And what were the value of those demands being out there in terms of your movement? Yeah, the demands, like I've said, were created on the basis of what we call the, the short term, the medium term, and the long term demands. Just the same principle we apply for uh, our geographic uh, uh, sphere of starting at the local, regional, and the national level. Now, the short term demands were things that over time you've been an activist on various things. And many of those things, like I was saying, that you, you, you win them and you lose in some of them, we have been battling, we were known to have been fighting these battles. Over time, there were small little battles that we fought. Like, for example, um, uh, uh, we will say the government must change the education system. The government must make books available for children. The government must extend, increase the budget for black child versus the white child. And those things have happened before. And that is what was leading 
to the confidence in people in what we are saying. Uh, you know, uh, at least the person, when he comes close to me, he, they know me from the days that we did this thing and so on and so on and so on. When you lost the battle there, you, you explain clearly why you lost it. You examine it. When we made a mistake, we say, yes, we blundered there and so on and so on. But basically, and then you will, for example, if you look at those demands, was that we said the army must get out of the township because the army. When it was in the township, it was affecting every home. So everybody was scared, and they wanted them out of the township. So for us to win that battle, it was easy to give in for that uh, 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 temporary suspension of the boycott, and to allow for our people to lick their wounds. At the same time, to make a lot of people fall off the tree of the white oppressors there eh, on that side coming to join us and others just move back and others really supported us materially now etc etc okay how about are you going to pose how it was a journalist at the time in south africa and uh, a good one at that but i don't know <laughs> come on right uh, <laughs> say, yeah, i want to i want to deal with uh, sorry. Because I'd like to deal with the issue of the breadth of the support that you that you had for the boycott. There's been some really interesting work done in the, over the last year or two by Mary Kachenowicz and Maria Stefan, who have struggled all over the world. And one of the things I've managed to certify is that the greater the diversity in terms of class and whatever of the support that a civil resistance campaign develops greater the prospect of success. Now, at the time that you were preparing for and called this boycott, you will remember that there were very, very serious debates, certainly among intellectuals in South Africa, in the opposition, about the extent to which the black working class should combine with other elements of the black community, particularly, let's say, the trading classes, as you had to, because the traders in the townships and the workers had to work together on this boycott. And I, I was recently, for another purpose, looking through some of the reportage of the at the time that you were preparing and, and conducting the boycott. And there were very serious debates about whether or not the working class should be on the same side as the black traders, etc., etc., etc. How did, my question is this, how did your committee deal with this issue and manage to maintain or to develop this broad-based -based approach that you did, which was clearly it seems to me, on the reading of what happens, crucial to your victory. Yeah, yeah look, uh, well, you know, funny enough, I have never been attracted to uh, political polemics. You know, uh, there were, as you know, <laughs> I was in the Eastern Cape, so we were less ideologically uh, inclined than the people in the Western Cape. That's why in the Western Cape they never managed to do such a thing because they couldn't. Because there were all sorts of various factions. Whether you call them this or whatever, they were there in the Western Cape and always made it difficult. In our area, for the language was important among other things, you know, which in many cases it has always been a factor. And the cultural background of most of the people was the same. And uh, if any concessions were made, which were, okay, I will say, for example, and also the adherence to the ANC's at the time uh, uh, position on non-racialism. So white people were part of the struggle, and the ANC, it was one of its strengths that racism had no place in the struggle. Therefore, and then we had the trade union with some of the, the so-called uh, ultra-leftists who were not supporting us. They first lost their battle in a thing that was called the Black Weekend of 18, uh, 19 of March, 1985, when my uncle was killed. Uh, when that happened, we, we had a 100% boycott without them. 
the issue was never an issue again. So I think it was uh, the mere strength of really looking at the issues that work rather than concentrating, going back to smaller issues which have no meaning anyway in what we're doing, as demonstrated by the success of that Black Weekend, which was shown as 100% reported to, even by everybody, by the state and everybody, as 100%. From there onward, there was no looking back, and there were, we never had again those problems there. Okay, okay, you can give, uh, give uh, the gentleman there from Zimbabwe. Oh, thank you. Uh, from the video, I realized that at some stage uh, during your struggle, um, it looks like some youths have got uh, impatient and uh, they resorted to some um, to violence, actually. So I want to understand from you how that uh, affected your struggle. You see, you, you see what happens, you see, when the leadership has a clear vision and a, a clear strategy of what they want to achieve, that undermines completely whatever the other people are doing. Like, let's say, yes, there, it wasn't, there were people, first of all, Nobody believed this thing was a correct thing to start with, as uh, you can hear from Howard's uh, uh, question. Other people questioned it because they didn't see the wisdom of it. It was a waste of time. The only way was a fight to the finish. Some people believed that, and others believed that, no, no, it was wrong to believe that this way because the state will react the way it reacts, so it gives us it. So whenever the state, when the state arrested us, it gave those voices an opportunity, you see. But because we have developed these layers of leadership structures at the time to have control at least of the behavior and discipline of people, that was easily uh, brought down and controlled. And in a way, uh, you will find that that played a, an insignificant role. But I think on things like those, you can never, I mean, uh, Anybody can tell us here what to do, all of us. But as long as that person who said it, said it with conviction, and the people see, see through his action that he means it, the people will fall in line. But otherwise, there will be some people who do their own things. There were actually bad things, as you listen to Bishop Tutu there speaking. Yeah, it was a sad day when he said that. Something bad has happened that day. And he, the bishop was very, very angry. Yeah. Okay. Can you give me a king there? Acousta, I was speaking in Geneva to a group of people about um, nonviolent struggle in Africa. The details are not important. But when I came to your involvement in the Port Elizabeth boycott, there was a South African historian president present who blasted me yeah. and said, but there was a great deal of coercion used to enforce that boycott. It was not voluntary. Can you enlighten me? I think, I mean, it's, uh, it's exactly what I was explaining now, that you did have that element, but it is not the overriding. It was, it never, Made. I mean, look, the people voted with their feet. I think people didn't, if, that assumes, if you, let's say, apartheid rulers, they were looking to hang me, okay? They sentenced terror recorded to 25 years and others. And then, the government told its police heads that there was what we call a miscarriage of justice in the case of those guys who were sentenced to 25 years. And I must be sent to the gallows to send a clear message. And that boycott was one of the reasons whereby they were looking for such an opportunity to get me to the gallows. The other one, they charged me with, a, with Molly Blackburn, a prominent uh, lady who was a white uh, woman who fought so hard 
for black people, but he died in a car accident. With me, Molly, myself, and another leader that have died, and another young journalist were charged for treason. But that treason, they couldn't bring the boycott into it. They had to call us for me, calling a, a band meeting for, for commemoration of a, a communist leader, and then I had that trial for that. So they, there was nobody, and the police locked us up. I mean, 21, 20, whatever, 30,000 people. There was no uh, 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 violence to the extent that it could have led to influencing the, 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 the buying of the people or the people refusing to go and buy the cars. So I would, I would certainly dispute that and say it is not true. And facts are there to prove that. I mean, the South African government, for those who don't know, it was that government, when it comes to the use of the laws they have created, it could be matched by no government anyway. Then, if you were caught with a book, a banned book, just one page, loose page, five years, full from the 17th to the 16th or 17th of, after five years of this month, that's how it comes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my, uh, my, my question is uh, about the cohabitation now between the black and, and the white people in South Africa. Because I think that during the, the apartheid, uh, there, is, there is a culture of hate between these uh, people. What, what about now? What is the relationship now between these people? You, did you say the competition? Sorry, the what? The what? Cohabitation. Oh, okay, sure. No, I mean, look, in South Africa at the moment, rather than it's an issue of black and white, it's more of a class issue. I think I stand a more risk of being <laughs> in the township than any other white person, you know, as a, as a, as a, on a class basis around our Look, I mean, uh, of course we we got problems, as you know. South Africans, they we say they you can't say in South Africa they hate you because they hate everyone. They hate themselves. <laughs> hate everyone. Blacks hate blacks. South Africans hate uh, uh, Zimbabweans and uh, Nigerians, uh, and South Africans hate whites. Whites hate blacks. Blacks hate color. Color hates that. The people from Port Elizabeth hate the people in the next to town. And so it's that kind of a thing. So everybody hates everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not uh, really on the, on the same uh, kind of uh, racially uh, defined things. There's no such thing, actually. Actually, uh, any South African is ashamed to make a racial statement or a racial issue. Okay. That one. Okay, we'll go that side uh, with two, maybe. Okay, there's somebody here, and then after that, we we'll go there. And then I'm sure we will be moving towards. Uh, how do you feel, Jack? Should I close now? We're, no, we're fine. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wonder, what, didn't the uh, apartheid regime uh, ever try to uh, bribe some of the uh, boycott leaders because? Um, or were they too self-confident to do that? Because that is more dangerous to them, oh, yeah. uh, uh, to the uh, to the movement, than uh, brutal repression. I think. Now you see, in they South try to divide uh, the people. Not true. You see, in South Africa at that time, as you can see, black people were the same. So it wouldn't make sense for a leader to take money from them. <laughs> you know, what are they going to do with it? So it was not, uh, uh, they didn't uh, bribe. They, actually, those who, who, who collaborated with them, they wouldn't have collaborated on the basis of the money. They would have collaborated on the basis that they didn't, they didn't understand what they were doing. Once they find themselves in there, and they feel the punches and the torture and all that, and then they give in. 
and then on the basis of that they could turn them easier that way rather than money. In South Africa, money at that time wasn't the issue. You couldn't, honestly, you couldn't attract the, uh, the people in the struggle with money, no ways. You will only blackmail them with maybe they torture me and then I tell them where you stay and uh, where you hide something and then they'll come back to me and say they're gonna tell my friends because I blackmailing was the best instrument for them available. Other than that, they couldn't, they couldn't buy you a car or something like that. And of course it did happen for, but those mostly they did that with, wouldn't be people drawn from the, from the movement. People could have been just a, an opportunist that find himself amongst us and uh, when he sees, <laughs> wants to get out of prison and then they say, okay, fine, we'll get you out. So those, there were few of those people, even if they went and happened. Okay. Um. I'm trying to understand, I'm trying so far to understand that um, it was just on the basis of um, the shared um, understanding of the problem of the blacks that united them that much. Because I also happen to be from a society where uh, there is a gap, but the people seem to be acting like they are, they are contented with the situation. So. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to find out from you if there is another thing that caused that common front for your peers and the black society. Because um, if it is just on the basis of they were feeling the pinch equally, I, I know of a set of people who also should feel this, the pinch of, of pain equally, and yet it's not propelling them to act. So is there any other thing, or was it the tone the leaders were using to inspire them to act? I don't know whether you understand. You mean at that time? Yes. Now, remember at that time, uh, black South Africans mostly, you see, they were, whether you were educated in South Africa, you were black, you couldn't buy a place uh, to go and stay in a, a suburb that is nice, you stay there with other people. So uh, whether you are a lawyer, whether you got business, the best you can do when you got business to buy yourself nice cars, that's all, nothing else. And therefore, today, at that time, all of us, we were one against apartheid. It's just that at the beginning, most of those people were not there because they were scared. But when they saw these individuals who, who we have shown this bravery of taking head on this powerful monster, they started also to be brave, everybody. And then they started to be all one at that time, yeah. So there was no class distinction amongst black people. Educated or not educated, you were all black people discriminated. You couldn't get into these toilets if they are written white because you got a PhD from Harvard. You go there where it says non-blacks, non-whites, it doesn't even say blacks, it says non whites as if you want to be white. Go there, that's it. That was it. Show that way. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, your employee there mentioned outside pressure. Um, and there's been a lot of debate among act activists on, on how effective the outside boycotts. Um, were and how much uh, effect the, the outside activism had. So uh, as a person who works with the conflict from the outside, I'll be interested to hear your evaluation on how effective international activism was in this question, and also about the unwillingness of many governments to, to do the right thing and support you. Sorry, can you, can you repeat? Yeah. Okay, how, how effective do you think the international activism oh, yes, was? Okay. And, and also about how many governments refuse to do the right thing and oh, support it? Yeah, okay. Look, I mean, our job was easy. Uh, that's why I'm saying uh, I wouldn't necessarily think that other people got uh, an easy task as we had. Remember, racism generally is hated by everybody. And I think if we 
we were not at the time of the Cold War. I think apartheid maybe could have collapsed quicker because some of some governments they were opposed to apartheid or racism and so on. And I believe them they were. But more than anything, to them what was important was the Cold War issue. And then therefore they didn't take our side. But we managed to activate people all over the world, in the United States, in Great Britain, in Europe, across the Scandinavian countries, uh, to get support from people, everybody. We had a voice that could be listened to. And then we speak to them, and those people spoke in their areas, and they spoke with our people, and they help us in that fashion. Of course, other governments help us on humanitarian grounds, like the Scandinavian countries, they always made sure that they pay for our legal bills when we were arrested, and they didn't want to give us anything else other than that. And of course, they voted in support of us in the resolutions that condemn South Africa, the United Nations. So we, we enjoy that kind. And of course, more than anything, like I say, the issue of racism is an issue that is hated by a lot of people. And therefore, it was not a difficult task to mobilize people against racism. Uh, one more question. My question is fear. How did you deal with fear? Because it sounds like, I mean, it doesn't need further explanation. How did you deal with fear? Well, we'll do a two part question. <laughs> okay, you want to ask another one? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> At what point did it strike you and others in the struggle uh, that it was not going to be the MK that would liberate you, that it would essentially have to come through civil insurrections and the armed struggle could be a supportive role perhaps, but not the, the central focus as many people had previously assumed? No, we, we look, MK has been there since 1963, so there was no there was no uh, high activity that uh, was suggesting that there was something imminent from that side, all right? The only thing that we saw was just that apartheid South Africa was getting strong. <laughs> Remember, they kicked us, uh, they kicked uh, the, uh, the military presence of South Africa out of Mozambique through the Komati Accord of 1984. So that was a blow. And for me, it was a blow, actually, because I thought that apartheid had finished us, because we trusted uh, President Samora Michel as a revolutionary and all that and all that. But apartheid, like I told you the truth today, which very few of you, very few people will tell you, but I, I can tell you now, most South Africans are going to tell you what I'm telling you, that apartheid forces could have occupied the whole of Africa. They were strong enough to do that. So, eh? <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, the other about that, there was no activity at the time. We, we were believing now in our own hands to take issues upon ourselves. Uh, the reason why people now are starting to tell the truth is funny how history goes. People started first in a euphoria and tell and create a, a fictional history. But as time goes, for some unknown reason, in South Africa now, you'll hear people now telling the truth, things as they were, instead of talking nonsense and saying that this and that and that, uh, mythical wars and battles which never existed and so on. And then about the fear, now look, I mean the fear, of course, um, let me put it this way, the fear, more than fearing death, because that was out of the question. Remember, in Port Elizabeth, or South Africa by that time, 87 people have died in police detention. By the very police that were there telling us every day, it's going to be your turn now. I'm, I'm just fed up with you. You are going next one. But also, so the fear of that kind wasn't the fear that we have. 
But the fear was a disappointment of our people not to continue the battle. So for every campaign that we were embarking upon, of course, I used to be nervous myself for every rally, everything, because I wanted always to see the results. That was mostly the fear that gripped me a lot, but not the fear of torture, the fear of death, because if you fear that, please step aside, because people were dying just in front of you. There was no question of uh, luck and things like that. But thank you very much for that. Uh,